Buffy. I know, we do need, I, yes, absolutely. Although, I need some more spike in my life as well. But, um, uh, a transition to, I will just briefly talk about uh, panic. And, um, and then actually that will lead us really into talking about writing from male perspectives, because we've both done that. But, um, so panic is a standalone. It's realistic fiction. So it's a big departure from Delirium, my Delirium series. Um, and uh, that was both deliberate and also probably unconscious, um, if you can have both. Um, but Panic is about a small town ca called Carp. So my first book, Before I Fall, is also standalone and realistic, and awesome if you haven't read it. Yeah. Um, but um, it's about, uh, that takes place in a community that's kind of wealthy and suburban and kind of similar to the town that in which I grew up. Um, the world of Panic is very different. It takes place in a much more rural and also deeply impoverished community where the community is plagued with problems um, that affect many rural impoverished communities in our country. Um, so there's drug use and there's alcoholism and you know all of the stuff that usually comes along with some, some pretty big socioeconomic Kids play have invented, the seniors, well actually all the kids have invented a dangerous game called Panic. Um, this is both a way of entertaining themselves and also a way of getting out. They painstakingly collect money throughout the year, a dollar a day from everybody, every day that school's in session. And graduating seniors can compete if they choose to in panic during the summer. And they have to do a series of challenges that relate to fear, um, fear-based challenges um, where they have to basically just encounter really terrifying things and show no fear and um, points are deducted for crying out or for acting hesitant and of course you get kicked out if you don't actually complete the complete the challenge um and so this is a game that has been going on for years and it's kind of legendary and panic is now um it's told from two different points of view um heather is one character dodge is another and they're playing for very different reasons heather is playing for um for escape really for the for the promise of escape and dodge is playing because he wants revenge um and uh, I, I, it was my intention. Oh, they don't end up together, though. By the way, it, that is not. They don't. They do have romances, but not with each other. Um, and actually, partly that was my intention because I wanted two characters that the reader would root for, but they're both. They both want the same thing. So you, as the reader, are hopefully put in a position of, you know, having having kind of a moral quandary around it and not really knowing who you're rooting for at any different time. So, and why? now transitioning to talking about two different narrators. So why did you choose to structure our with dual narrator? Well, the first one is only from boys POV, and yeah. then the second one is is mm -hmm. the boy and the girl. But we, we deliberately wrote Beautiful Creatures from a boy's perspective because we really wrote it on a dare. It was not meant to be published. <laughs> we wrote it um, like to meet the specifications of seven teenagers. This was before Hunger Games had come out. Um, I believe the second Twilight yeah. book had just come out, so I think yeah. they made me read that with them. And <laughs> well, they you loved... should maybe say you were a teacher. Oh, yeah, sorry, I was a teacher for 17 years. I didn't just hang out with, like, <laughs> strange <laughs> children at, at a mall. That would, right, that would be disturbing. And um, my, uh, they were my students. Um, two of them were Margie's daughters, which Margie and I met when her oldest daughter was in, was in my third grade class. And um, they, you know, they loved Twilight. They loved all these books, but one of their complaints was that... Um, in all these books, the boy always seemed to be like the vampire or this powerful supernatural or the one with all the cool powers, and the girl just got to fall in love and follow the boy around. And so we decided if we were going to write them a story, because that's what we called it, we wanted to write from the perspective of a regular boy who falls in love with the girl with supernatural powers. So, um, and we also really, I have my sister, I have one sister, but I have four brothers, so I really do know, and my sister was born, growing up I had four brothers, I do really know a lot more about boys than girls, and Margie has two brothers and no sisters. Right. So it felt kind of natural in a weird way to write boys, like we kind of channeled like all the, the things we knew about teen boys. Can you tell me up. what you know about teen boys and I'll judge whether I wrote Dodge accurately? <laughs> I thought you wrote Dodge very accurately. Uh, the one thing that I loved that was super authentic about him is that most girls don't realize that boys worry about all the same things they do. Like, they worry about, like, if they look cool in front of the girl, mm -hmm. if they're dressed right, you know, if they have something in their teeth, they wait to see if the girl's going to call them or text them. Like, my brothers would, like, pace around in the kitchen pretending <laughs> they weren't trying to see if someone was going to call. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Nothing. 
Yeah. You know, but they'd be like, don't use the phone. I was like, well, I need to use the phone. Like, you don't need to use the phone right now. <laughs> but like, yeah. we would see these girls at school that they were waiting to see if they would like return their call. My brother wouldn't even like look at them. I'm like, why don't you go talk to her? He's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, so it was same stuff. one of the things we wanted to show was two of the, the kids were boys. And one of them, Alex, used to say like, the other thing that's bad is all of these boys in these books are jerks. Yeah. They're like, how come they're not, they can't be like a regular nice guy. They'll have to be like super cool and not like, like the girl. Yeah. yeah, or they have to be like, you know, they have to behave like stalkers. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so we wrote about like regular, sweet, like boy who, you know, loved his mother figure and had good friends and like. He lived in a small southern town and said yes, ma'am, and yeah. he reminded me of my little that, brother. Actually, kinda. because I love that because I mean, obviously, beautiful creatures is paranormal, but I did feel for a long time as though in the paranormal kind of canon, most of the guys were like really unappealing to me because my mom taught me that if like you're not sure whether a boy wants to romantically date you or kill you and drink your blood <laughs> right. like you lo you lock your door and you call social he's services. He's unappealing now. Yeah exactly he's not appealing. But see Dodge was very authentic to me because one of the first things that I loved was there's like a scene where there's a girl he has a crush on and he's worried about like you know yeah. I didn't take a shower like do I smell do I have the right shirt on what does my hair look like what is she gonna think like I don't yeah. want her to see the inside of my house and like I remember all those conversations going yeah. on in the background well I do feel like and this is also what happens to me when people ask me like how I can write teen books or they're like oh you know do you hang out with a lot of teens to get into teen heads and I'm like look I'm a 31 year old woman I have no kids like that would be weird <laughs> if I just like hung out with like teens like hey guys we going shopping like no that's not cool you know um, and similarly, you know, I write middle grade as well. I have two middle grade books coming uh, out, and I have a series coming out next year, um, which I co-author with my father. Yep. No. Um, <laughs> yes. And I'm going to ask you about co-authoring in a second. But, um, but you know, I don't have kids, but, you know, I do tend to feel like actually at all ages and no matter across genres, I mean, across genders, like people do fundamentally want the same things. And people... <laughs> have the same attitudes and people like really there aren't that many things that people want you know they want to feel loved they want to feel seen they want a place that they feel at home and often those three things are kind of the same thing you know what i mean right. which is why when you fall in love people often describe it as like coming home you know um so so but that's i was really really happy to get the chance to write from a from a boy's point of view because I hadn't done it before. And then when you did split, did you, you guys don't alternate chapters, right? You we, write everything. We do. We we did dangerous creatures differently. We, what we did because you have to remember we weren't writing a book. We we're writing right. a story. So right. like the whole process was super organic. I was not a writer. I had written like Lena. I wrote like poetry all the time. Margie always says bad poetry. It was very good poetry. Uh -huh. But um, Margie always wanted to be a writer. So. What we did was we hatched the plan kind of on a napkin, and then she had all these whiteboards in her office at home, which was really her husband's office that we commandeered. And right. we mapped out, like, a world first. Yeah. Like, what are the rules? Who are supernaturals? What are the powers going to be? And then we kind of plotted the... We knew how the entire thing would end. We had no idea how long this thing was going to be. We knew yeah. kind of, like, these five main things are going to happen. And then we kind of, like, plotted out Act 1. And then she's like, okay, I'm going to start writing, like, the first chapter or two. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I didn't think she should really do it. So I didn't pay much attention to the whole thing. And then she yeah. did. Wow. And she's like, okay, will you write the next two? And then what we did was we traded. And we didn't really talk about it. But we're like, okay, and we're going to fix it up. Like, you fix up mine, I'll fix up yours. So we basically just, like, edited, but in the most brutal way that horrifies people who don't write with other people. Because what we did was, like, like, like we write in Word. We didn't, we actually didn't learn how to use track changes until we had an editor. Mm -hmm. So, like, I just, like, it, whenever something is bad, I just deleted it. And then if yeah. it was partially bad, I deleted the part that was bad, and then I, like, fixed up the other part. Yeah. Like when Murgy, like I said, like no one cares. No one wants to hear this much about his garden. Like we're on page five. Like pick four flowers, that's it. Which ones do you like? And I was like, great, cut. Like I cut all that out. And then I was like, and now there's going to be some decrepit, you know, stuff in the bushes. And she would do the same thing to mine. She'd be like, people can't just die all the time. Like we have to have thoughts in between the deaths. And she would add some thoughts in. And that's when we, but we would go back and forth so many so times much. that literally some sentences would have like part of my words and then like, you know, my beginning, her end. Yeah. And it really, and with dangerous creatures, the only difference is one of us is really the draft master because we're, you know, we both have the solo series yeah. to worry about. So 
like she drafted the first one and then every couple chapters I edited and yeah. I really edited in a very similar way except I did use track changes right yeah and um, now she's doing it for me right but we right. but we still stuck to the we outline everything together yeah. we discuss all the points so we both know what's gonna happen right and you know once you've written like because yeah. you know it's Larry once you've written a series and your characters are real, yeah. they're kind of going to do they what do they're going to do. Yeah, yeah. You can't, like, make them do stuff anymore. No, actually, it's funny because when I was writing the Delirium series, people ask you that, uh, you know, whether that's true. And, I mean, to some extent, you know, broad strokes, yeah. generally, you know, you can you you can influence the action, but it's true. Like after, you can I mean, put them in a bad situation. Right. You can put them in a, but they'll, like, find a, you can put them in a situation, but they'll have a response to it, kind of. And that's actually how I know when a book is working. Because I actually always... I have to write. I have to write every day. It's a compulsion. You do? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Like, I yeah, I have to. It's like it's actually really bad. I'm like, I'll, if I haven't written by the afternoon, you can tell because I look like a drug addict that's fiending. I'm like rocking and like <laughs> scratching myself. It's really, it's, it's it's a serious thing. It's a habit. I mean, at this point, I've been writing every day since I was basically. But nine. do you have like a specific like word count or amount of time you write, or yeah. do you just write for a little bit? No, I, I write suspect. a word count every day. Um, but if I. <laughs> The weirdest thing is, this is how big of a dork I am. So I really love writing. Like people are like, you know, what are your ho hobbies other than writing and reading? And I'm like, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm like, other than that, I like eating. to eat, sleep, and drink wine. Like those are my hobbies, you know. Um, and two of them are necessarily for like necessary for survival: eating and drinking wine. But um, <laughs> so I like, so I have to write every day, and I like any other habit like running you get better at it so you have it kind of takes you most days it's quicker to get to the same word count and also like drug addiction you need more to give you the same feeling so i used to write a certain amount every day but now it doesn't like do it for me anymore so i have to write more and more so the way that this happens is that like i'll be writing a book i'll be working on something i'll hit my word count and i'm like oh wow that only took two hours I should really reward myself because that only took me two hours. Oh, I know. I'll write. I'll reward myself by doing fun writing. So then I'll start writing something else. And something different? Something totally different. And I'll start writing that. And then, like, at about 20,000 words, something I'm like, ah, this won't be published. And then 20,000 words. And I'm like, actually, it's kind of good. I'm going to show it to my agent. <laughs> 20,000 words in the same day? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. Like, we can't do events anymore. No. If that's okay. <laughs> so then, like, a month, um, two months later, okay, I'm like, I have 20,000 words. So I showed that to my agent. He's like, it's great. We'll sell it. So we sell that. So now I'm working on two books simultaneously because I have to work on everything every day. So then I'll like be working on two books simultaneously and I'll finish it, like my writing, and I'll be like, oh, that only took me five hours. Oh, I know. I'll do some fun writing. And that's how I ended up writing three books simultaneously last year. So, yeah, I'm trying to keep it at two simultaneously. Anyway, whatever. That was a long story. <sighs> and my I point hate is writing two things at one time yeah. because I'm like a, such a teacher. I'm all about completion. Like, I love the process, but I'm just like, oh my God, like, like I literally I have like a calendar yeah. and I'm like, I have to be on this page by this date or I'm going to be late. And like, everyone's like, you know, deadlines are fake. You yeah. the, they're only in place for you to be late. That's the entire purpose of being a writer. <laughs> I can't handle it. Yeah, like, me neither. I can't. The, the second book of this Un yeah. Unmarked was late. Like, I mean, I moved, you know, my yeah. mother had some health problems. Like, it didn't matter. It, like, every night, it was, like, haunting me. It was yeah. awful. I was like, now I understand, like, you're talking about alcoholism. I'm like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I feel like I can't sleep. I was like, I need a meeting. Because, like, yeah, and, I and my friends were like, you're not that late. It's fine. Your editor said it's fine. I'm like, no, it's not fine. Like, my life is I never going to be I'm happy again until I'm finished with this book. I'm the same way about deadlines. But also, because towards the end of a book, you really do feel like it tilts off your head. You'll never be happy again. But, That's um, true. But yeah, no, what I meant to say was I always <laughs> intended to kill a character off in Requiem. And then when I got to Requiem, the character just like resolutely refused to die. Like would not consent to be killed. So I couldn't do anything about it. I had to let that character live. And instead I just killed off somebody else to fulfill my quota. Um, but, but I found that transitioning between Delirium and... And panic was really difficult because I'd been so engrossed in the world and everything else. Oh, yeah. Did you find that when you were switching between the series and the Unbreakable? I was actually, because we had written four books in the Beautiful Creature series and an e-novella, like, I like I was ready for something different. Like, we both really were because it was weird. It was like we were sad. We were, you know, it's kind of like a breakup. You know, it's like you don't, you don't want to leave that series, but you want something new. You don't know if, you know, maybe we should just write this forever and we'll never be able to write anything else. So then you have to prove to yourself you can. 
And I loved writing Unbreakable. What I did not anticipate was how hard writing the second one was going to be. Mm -hmm. Because A, I had never written, neither Mark or I had ever written a book by ourselves. Well, I was going to say. So oh, no, no. So all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my God, why is this taking so long? <laughs> like, I, this is taking forever. And she was just like, oh, my God, I'm never going to finish Icons. We are never going to finish these books. I was like, no, we're not going to finish these books. And my... We're going to die here. My husband was like, you do realize it's going to take twice as long, right? Because now there's only one of you. And I was like, oh, that's horrible. So... I loved writing it because I liked creating a new world. I liked being totally in control of it. I liked, I mean, literally, Mark, because Margie started Icons first. The deal was she had always wanted to be a writer. So I'm like, okay, I'll write, we, we're writing these books, but eventually you have to write like your own solo book that you were always going to do. She's like, okay, but you have to also. And I said, sure, I will, which was a total lie. And then <laughs> she started writing and then we were done. And she's like, okay, well, what are you writing about? I was like, oh, I don't know. She's like, you have to start writing like your book. And then I was like, crap, I actually must write a book now. So she was, this went on and on, and then I went to a, a retreat with like Melissa Marr and Carrie Ryan and a bunch of people, and they were like, well, what's your book about? I was like, there's no book, people. Yeah. Like, let's be real. I'm, I'm here to eat. There's no book. I'm not writing anything. There's a lot of eating in Red And so, <laughs> finally, Margie was, was like, Margie and Holly Black, is who workshopped all of this book with me, was like, and Carrie was like, well, what do you like? And I was like, okay, these are the things that are I'm interested in. Murder. And no one, no one said, no, no, not in any particular order, um, superstition, Voodoo, ghosts, serial killers, and uh, secret societies. And Margie's like, that's what the book's about. And I was like, no, that doesn't work at all. And I was like, oh, that totally will work. Yeah. And I even got serial, killer, serial killers. I got a serial killer ring. So everyone's like, that's the part that's like not going to work out. And I was like, no, that's the easy one. I can yeah. always find a place to put a serial killer. <laughs> but so I wrote a book about secret societies and ghost hunting and all this weird stuff that only interested me. And there's plenty of Buffy references. So I'm like, and Buffy. And yeah. she's like, well, you can't write about that. Someone already did that. <laughs> so, you know, I, but it was very difficult. Yeah. And I, I will be interested like to hear the difference when you're writing with your dad. Because for me, it's so... It is, it's the opposite. It's the, it, the fix is I give the pages to Margie and all of a sudden she calls me. She's like, oh my God, it's like the best thing you've ever written. I love it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is amazing. And like, and you're a reader. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm waiting to get the chapters back to find out what's going to happen next. Yeah. When I'm reading my own book, I'm like, oh my God, I know what's going to happen next. And I'm pretty sure it's awful. Yeah. This whole book is awful and it's going to take nine months until anyone reads it to find out how crappy it really is. Yeah, no, I felt, you know, it's funny because I usually do always feel like anything I'm working on is um, really, really horrible. And people ask me how I know when a book is done and I usually describe it as like that feeling you get at Thanksgiving where you're like full but you're not that full and then you take like another bite of cornbread and all of a sudden you're going to puke yes that's how I feel and that's when I know to turn to pass my book on to my editor when I'm like if I look at this one more time I am going to throw up on the page or to <laughs> yeah um, and but I particularly had that it's funny because I think Panic actually now is my favorite book I've my favorite teen book I've written so far um, I think it's my best book, but um, I hated it when I was writing it. I hated it. I literally, like, and I know, I already knew by the then that I, I feel this way when I'm writing books. So normally, even though I feel that way, I can usually talk myself out of it. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I usually hate it, but then my editor or my agent usually likes it or they'll tell me how to fix it. With this, they both had to, like, talk me off the ledge several times because I was like, I'm not, I'm not turning this in. I'm not finishing it. Yeah. Forget it, you know? Um, and I think partly, I think partly that's because I was trying to do my best work. Like I was pushing myself and I wasn't quite sure it, the book in my head was always so different than the book I was managing to get on the page. Um, but also I think it was because, you know, having written Delirium and lived in that world, just, it was so, it was so different and it was such a different place that I didn't know how to like measure it. You know what if I mean? If it was good. If now, was do good. you have critique partners? Does anyone read for you while you're writing at all? Um, no, not, not really. I mean, in fact, I, it, you know, I always kind of, I've always written and I've always, I don't know if I always wanted to be a writer. I mean, at a certain point I wanted to be a backup dancer for Beyonce, which obviously is what I'll do now if I'm not a writer. But, um, you know, I, I've always written, I always knew I would try to write a novel at a certain point and get it published. Um, but I had never even taken a writing class until graduate school. When I did, I found out I was looking to get my PhD after college because I'd been bartending for years having majored in philosophy and literature and writing and failing to write novels and um and then I was 
I was I was gonna get my PhD because my mom's a professor of English, my dad's a professor, my parents divorced and remarried professors, my sister's a professor. Like in my family, if you don't know what to do, you get a PhD. <laughs> so I was looking into PhD programs and I found out that you could get actually a master's program in creative writing and just study writing, which seemed like such a better deal to me. But that was the first time anybody had ever read my work. You know, That's just crazy. going into that classroom at 25. And yes, I did cry, but not in front of, not publicly on the first day. <laughs> So I still have a kind of, I mean, very, very rarely, if I'm really stuck, I'll show it to like my agent or sometimes my father. Um, but but it, that's kind of rare. I usually just work on some kind of head down until yeah, I... Yeah, and I'm so used yeah. to like, that. Like, this totally. one, I mean, Car I mean, in, you know, I mean, I've read for Holly, but Holly read for me and Carrie read for me. Yeah. And, um, and then for the second one, Ransom read for me yeah. and Holly read for me. And, um, yeah, but I mean, see, for me, I can't, like, that's so long for me, like, yeah. 300 pages, and I, because I, I really don't know, like, when I'm writing, unless it's, like, because that's the thing about having a writing partner, you have a fail-save, like, if I write something bad, I know either Margie will call me and be like, okay, like, this is really interesting, but it has nothing to do with what we're writing. Right. And you can't kill everyone in the book in the first, like, <laughs> you know, book in the series, there's no one left now, like, so you need to work on that chapter all over again mm -hmm. or she'll be like this you're on the right track just right. keep going right but not you know not having that when i think most writers like you were saying think yeah. that what they're writing is awful at the yeah, time definitely. but for me it's much harder for me to talk myself off the ledge yeah. i am always um it's always much easier for me to see where someone else is going and how that's going to create a beautiful shape yeah. when they work it out like me i'm just like this is like a huge train wreck yeah. And I'm just going to, like, quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, and I do talk out loud. I have a, a business as well uh, called Paper Lantern Lit. And I do, see, because my, where I really get stuck, and my natural skill set is not in plotting and narrative, um, which is ironic given that, that I now have also a company that just does that, basically. But partly I did that, you know, so that I could continue to hone a skill that doesn't come... Like, I oh, can I describe... I can describe... Oh, I, like, could talk... I could do character development for 800 pages. I have done that. I've written an 800-page novel. You're like Margie. I know. I've written an 800-page novel where not a single interesting thing occurs, <laughs> which is mathematically improbable. <laughs> um, but that's happened. That happened to me in graduate school. Um, actually, I wrote it twice. Which is hard to believe because uh, the one of the things I was going to say about Panic is it's so tightly plotted. It's like now, really that, and, that's, and that's not to say that the, I mean it's fantastic yeah. character development, yeah. but what impressed me was I could obviously see the overlapping of the stories. You know, Dodge's story and Heather's story. They they know each other. They you know they become friends, and then there's all these other characters that are you know seen kind of secondary. That one of the things I loved which is very kind of classic Southern mm -hmm. Gothic, and this is not yes. Southern Gothic, is the idea that, like, you literally populated an entire town. Like, you have, I know the names of all these people. I knew, like, yeah. you know, their dads, the moms. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't just say, like, the lady who works at the diner or, right. like, my neighbor. Everybody right. had a name. Everybody had, like, these idiosyncrasies that were, yeah. like, very, very authentic. Yeah. But I felt like all these other strands of other characters started coming in about midway through the novel, and I was like, oh my god, she but like hardcore plotted this. Well, I do. I like, have to, all because these otherwise I would in. write something completely without plot. It would just be a description of trees. Yeah, but so, like, I have <laughs> read novels without plot and helped many a person with a plotless novel. Like, this yeah. does not seem like it could have been a plotless novel because yeah. it's no, it I does did. intersect in so many different ways. I feel like you had to know those things I were coming. I did know. At some point. I did know. No, no, no. I mean, I, I definitely spend tons of time outlining. But that I would think I start, that was a natural you know? thing for you because yeah, it's, no. it's well, thank well, you. it's not. It's all fake. Um, <laughs> let's talk now. No, but it's just something that I really have to like struggle with anyway. But I, what I was going to say is, I do talk about plot with Lisa, of my business partner. Okay. Like, when I write Panic, I don't show her pages, but when I'm writing a book, or uh, this happened recently, I have, an, I have a teen coming, teen YA novel coming out. Oh my god, another next, one? Next year called, yeah. She's Vanishing like the fastest Girls. Writer. What's it and called? Vanishing Girls. And, um, and that. that was, we, you know, we went out to dinner one night, and again, wine was involved, but um, she, I really, that, I was like, this has no plot. Like, there's no front story. There's really cool backstory, and there's a really cool thing that happens, and only one of them, and, like, there's no front story, there's no... And she really helped me. She helped me with my Anna So there is that kind of workshopping. I don't, like, work Anna Bubble. Got but it. I want to talk about, actually, Southern Gothic, now that you mention it, because one of the things I really love, both about your standalone, but... All, well, first of all, I love voodoo, superstition, 
Um, I love cats, which I know you hate. Um, <laughs> um, I don't hate cats. I would have hurt a cat. But I, anything I that can see spirits is not cat. welcome in my home. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't want a cat alerting me if there's someone dead in my house. Like, they yeah. can stay outside where they belong. Yeah, but um, I do feel house. like... Yeah, exactly, which they do. I feel like your books use setting really well to evoke kind of moods of that, that, that are like homages to old Southern Gothic. Is that deliberate or would you, cause you didn't grow up with in the South. My mom's from, my mom's whole family's from the South. And I grew up in the house with my great grandmother and my grandmother who were both like from North Carolina. Like they came right up, right. you know, like my great grandmother, I thought all vegetables had baking grease in them. Like <laughs> I thought that was like part I wish of that were true. what you put in the vegetable when you're cooking it in the pot. Um, you know, like I, no idea you could buy like biscuits in like a package or like I mean oh my god if my grandmother had ever like gotten a wind of this quick yeah that was like sacrilege yeah so no I mean they I grew up in the house with them mm -hmm. I mean both of them mm -hmm. and my great grandma didn't work so like when we came home from school my I called her nanny but she wasn't I mean now people have nannies she was my great grandma she was my nanny she was like yeah. the person who was there when I got home and we went down to the, the town many times yeah. to see my cousins who all thought it was okay to try to kiss you because you really aren't that related. <laughs> That's amazing. It's not okay. <laughs> um, I, I told, I said, listen, it doesn't matter, you guys. It's not, it's not okay. Yeah. And we, but Mur and Murky's family is from a small town in the West. And what we figured out, you know, because Beautiful Creatures is also like your books in many countries. Um, and we have the same French publisher, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I think I saw your book in French when I was yeah, there. Yeah, um, we definitely do. They, small towns are small towns. I mean, for me, we were writing this book, you know, for seven specific teens. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird is in the book. One of the reasons mm -hmm. is because it's my favorite book, and they told me that um, they didn't understand why they're being forced to read it in school. It was completely socially irrelevant. Nothing like that happens anymore. And there's no parallels toward anything that is happening today. So we created discrimination mm -hmm. between supernaturals and non-supernaturals. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the end, you know, they came to realize, as everyone should, that To Kill a Mockingbird is the most brilliant book I ever written. Book, yeah. And, um, you know, we, I mean, Ama, who's the kind of Ethan's grandmother, he's her mother figure because his mother's dead. She is basically like my great grandmother and Margie's mm -hmm. great grandmother mashed together, although Margie said she's mostly like an older version of me because she's <sighs> really superstitious and small and very fierce and she bakes really well. And I'm you a very bake really well? Uh -huh. So does Hannah, because our my, my stepmother is in, in Um hello, amazing where are the baked bake. goods? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. We we really can bake. But um so what but but I do feel and that's one of the things also about carp, because like if you I didn't realize it was not a real place. Mm -hmm. And people always say, I'm going to South Carolina, how do you find right. Gatlin? And I'm like, yeah. it's not like it's based kind of on a real place, yeah. but it's not a real place. But I feel like um I feel like there are different kinds of books. I mean, there's really super plot-driven adult books mm -hmm. where, you know, it's like a crime thing mm -hmm. and it could be in any state. For me, like, I need to know, and that's why I like to, like, I want to know, like, what do the people do on the weekends? Did they have a library? What do they eat? Like, you know, I, mm -hmm. like, to me, there's a big difference in life between, like, you know, people who, you know, I mean, like, my daughter said, what are grits? And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, she's six years old, and she doesn't know what grits are. Yeah. Like, what is wrong? I was like, and we took her to Yolfa. I'm like, yeah. we need to fix this immediately. Yeah, yeah. But, like, there's certain universals that have to happen. I feel like plot, I feel like um, even in a dystopian, whatever the, the universe is you're creating, that is a character. Yeah. Like, that setting is part of the book. Like, that creates the entire backdrop for what you're doing. And I need, I feel like that place you should be able to like imagine it, mm -hmm. smell it. Like I could see them jumping off the rocks and I was like, oh, I can go there and see what it's really like one yeah. day. And then I read her, an interview with her and she's like, I made it up. And I was like, all right, like, that can't be true. Yeah. She's just being modest. Yeah. No. <laughs> Although there is a place in Vermont where we used to climb up and jump off the rocks, but not as the start of a terrifying game that might lead to our deaths. So, right. Um, and, <laughs> and in this one, I just used DC. I grew up near DC. Yeah. I used real places. I used Georgetown University. But the other thing is I really like to do research. Yeah. And if you base something on like when I did New Orleans for Beautiful Darkness, I'm like, oh, Marty, we really have to go there. Yeah. 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 Obviously. During Mardi Gras. Yeah. yeah we <laughs> like eat the food and go there. I mean, I didn't mention I'd been there before. She hadn't yeah. been there. Yeah. 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 But I mean, don't no, you know, that's Fun. Don't you feel like it lends an authenticity totally. in a way? Well, I mean, because, yeah, I absolutely do. And I think that, you know, especially because it, as you said, it creates a backdrop, but it's also, I mean, like, you know, it, it's a choice that then informs the whole tone of the novel because, you know, w what people believe about ghosts or voodoo in one area of the country may not be the same and how they react in another area of the country. And so you can use those to shape kind of the rest of the character's beliefs and 
you know, not just give a mood to something, but also make the, the characters, the real human characters, have specific attitudes. But just like Panic, that, yeah. the, so the socioeconomic uh, backdrop of the town that you created is right. why this exactly. was believable. Exactly. Because if there's were, nothing to yeah. do there, and all the kids want to get out. So, of course, like... I mean, because you didn't mention, I mean, these are not just fear challenges. Like, you, some of these challenges, like, they can, you can die. Like, yeah. they're doing dangerous, very daredevil things where people have gotten killed and can get killed. Yeah. So, if this was happening in, like, a upper right. middle class suburban neighborhood, this right. would not be very believable. Right. It's true. And I think that, and you mean, it really fuels their sense of desperation. And, you know, I mean, these, the kids are competing for ultimately what amounts to about $50,000 a year, which for anybody is a huge amount of money. But for these kids, I mean, this is like a new life. This is like, they will get out. And I think what then makes it, I think absolutely it wouldn't have been believable. You have to create con you have to create a context in which people would be so desperate to escape um, that they would do desperate things. And I think then, but ironically, or not ironically, but I think what also makes it kind of uh, empathetic for people who are reading it is I think that all of us have also had the experience of, especially Heather, she's not just trying to escape her situation. I mean, on a, some fundamental level, she wants to outrun herself. She thinks if she can just leave, she can be a different person and she can be lovable and she can be prettier and she can just ha be worth something because she doesn't really feel like she's worth very much. And I feel like that is a very common thing that people fear and those anxieties are really common, which is also why I, I tend to relate better to characters who really do have to go through some transformation before yeah. they see their self-worth. I wasn't born, hopped out of the womb thinking I was amazing. I mean, it's still, I still have days where it's very hard not to be crippled with self-doubt or self-criticism or everything else. Um, and certainly through my teen years, I was just a freaking mess, you know? So that's kind of the characters, those are the kind of characters I like, right, and they have to discover through, you know, through their relationship with other people, that might be romantic, it might be friendship, it might be, in this case, there's a relationship with a parental figure who's finally not a total mess, because Heather's family, mom, is horrible, um, and an addict, and various things that come along with that, but, um, so I definitely feel like that's also what people relate to in this book, is, like, everybody can understand the feeling of, like, oh, if I could just press a button... Or even if I had to do something really hard, but suddenly I could just be made new and my life would be easy and I would be better and I would be confident and everything would be remade. Like, what wouldn't you do to have that feeling? You know, at certain points, I think people do a lot for that feeling. Yeah, and in Unbreakable, um, one of Kennedy's biggest, the, the heroine in my book, one of her biggest problems is she is her own worst enemy. You know, she, even when, you know, even when it's obvious that she belongs as part of this group, you know, part of her biggest problem is her mother didn't pass down, you know, any, you know, none of them are supernatural. They're all regular kids, but they have very technical um, area of, areas of expertise in which they've been trained. You know, one of them's a hacker. One of them is an engineer. He designs all the weapons that they use. Um, and she doesn't see herself as having anything special about her or any special talents. So it's very difficult through the series for her to... Um, feel like she has anything to offer the group because she feels like well not only do I not know what my specialty is I don't actually have any significant talents to offer mm -hmm. like what you know like yeah. I'm dead weight basically right. right and I think that um and I think that's also why you know we were talking about earlier why so many adults read young adult novels and you know I mean I always subscribe the teacher in me always says the basic thing like young adult when I you know I am much older than uh, Lauren and when I was uh, younger, there was no young adult section. There wasn't when I was younger. Yeah, there was none. There was like, I mean, there was G. Bloom, but she didn't have a section. She was in like kids. And also she's, I mean, just, that's not really what how we define teen anymore. I mean, teen is right. so varied, but like high teen. Yeah, but there was no, I mean, it was like her and the outsiders and everything else. Like, yeah. if, I mean, then the outsider still is in the adult, in the literature section. Yeah. It's not always YA. Now they're kind of like, they put yeah. it in both. But, um, you know, I, I do feel like most adults unless you're super self-actualized and very, very, you know, confident and strong, 